Hello and welcome back to Population Genetics and uh, Selection. The purpose of this web lecture is to uh, fill in some more detail about what you've been reading about how natural selection can work in different ways to actually maintain genetic diversity rather than simply removing it the way it normally would in a selective sweep. Just to remind you of the major learning goals in this course, we've been talking a great deal about the circumstances under which evolutionary change will and will not happen, first in terms of Darwin's four postulates at the trait level, and then using the Hardy-Weinberg conditions at the molecular level. And we've started to talk a little bit more about the molecular mechanisms that increase, maintain, and decrease genetic diversity. And remember that this is really important because remember Darwin's first postulate is that organisms are going to vary in some important ways and they really can't have that phenotypic variation unless there's the underlying genetic diversity to uh, produce that phenotypic variation. So this is really a key element in making this whole mechanism of evolution by natural selection go. You may recall on the very first day of class when we talked about what this course in evolution is all about, we said that this is a course about diversity, about organismal diversity, and genetic variability is the basis for organismal diversity. So first let's talk about what factors increase genetic variation, and you may remember in class there is only one, and that is mutation. Mutation is the source of everything new under the sun if we talk about increases in the absolute amount of genetic variability in an entire species. At the population level, you can have migration that might increase the genetic variability within that population, but across the entire species, the only way you're going to get anything new at the genetic level is through genetic mutation, creation of new alleles, creation of new genes. This is where we get this diversity in genetic material. So that leaves factors that decrease and maintain genetic variation. And we're going to be building up these lists as we go through all of the rest of this unit on population genetics. So let's start with what factors decrease genetic variation. And we've already seen one. That is the selective sweep. So selection for recessive alleles or incomplete dominance. And we saw this figure here where you can see that in cases of additive or incomplete dominance, you get a very rapid increase in that allele frequency. So we're starting with a very rare new mutation that has a benefit. It's going to very quickly increase in the population as more and more of those alleles give the individuals that have them that benefit until it goes all the way up to fixation. Similarly with recessive alleles, um, a brand new rare Recessive mutation is going to take a while to start increasing in frequency. Why? Because it has to be in a homozygote. It has to find another copy of that allele before it's expressed. But once it becomes common enough in the population that it's going to have a very easy time finding another copy of that allele to form a homozygote, then it's going to very, very rapidly increase all the way to fixation and eliminate the other allele. So those are two forms of selection that decrease genetic variability, but we also see here a mechanism that maintains genetic diversity, and that is selection in favor of a dominant allele. So you see here that because both dominant homozygotes and heterozygotes have full fitness advantage, this allele is going to increase the most rapidly of all of the three of these up to a very high allele frequency but it's going to come very high but never actually become fully fixed in the population. And the reason for that is because the less fit recessive allele can always hide in those heterozygotes. The heterozygotes have exactly the same fitness as the dominant homozygotes. And so the res recessive allele can never be completely eliminated in the situation where you have selection in favor of a dominant allele. So this becomes the first on our list of factors that maintain stable genetic variation. It's going to keep both of those two alleles in the population, so selection for dominant alleles. Another mechanism that you saw in your reading is a situation called overdominance. This is also known as heterozygote advantage, so selection in favor of heterozygotes over homozygotes. So please remember both of these two equivalent terms, overdominance and heterozygote advantage. They mean the exact same thing, but you will see both of them in the literature and in textbooks about this mechanism. 
So one of the most commonly invoked examples of this overdominance or heterozygote advantage is with sickle cell anemia and the sickle cell trait. So the normal allele for this trait is denoted as A and it produces the normal red blood cell kind of biconcave shape that most people have in the red blood cells. The sickling allele causes the red blood cells to have this sickled shape, so it makes it very, very difficult for these cells to move through narrow capillaries and deliver oxygen to the tissues where they need to go. So if you're a homozygote for the sickle trait, you have only these sickle-shaped red blood cells, and this condition is called sickle cell anemia. It's a very debilitating condition with very low probability of surviving to adulthood. If you're a heterozygote for this trait, this figure is actually not entirely accurate. Um, basically, this is a co-dominant situation. You produce both normal red blood cells as well as the sickled cells. And normally, this is considered a completely benign condition. So there are normally no complications related to this. There's some evidence that under very high oxygen stress, um, it can pose a problem, but very, very little fitness consequence for having this heterozygote condition under normal conditions. But it turns out that in areas where malaria is prevalent, this sickled form of the red blood cells give some resistance to malaria. So the malaria um, parasite is not able to enter these cells. And so for heterozygotes that have both of these kinds of red blood cells, they're much, much less likely to be infected with malaria. So you can see in areas with malaria, these heterozygotes have the highest fitness. The AA homozygotes have a little bit lower fitness because of their susceptibility to malaria. And of course, the individuals with the sickle cell anemia have the very lowest fitness. Whereas in areas without malaria, um, virtually identical fitness in heterozygotes and wild-type homozygotes, and still very, very low fitness in the sickled homozygotes. So whenever you have the situation where the heterozygote is favored over both homozygotes, both alleles are maintained at this equilibrium frequency between the two. So if you look at this graph, the allele frequency of one of the two alleles is plotted on the x-axis. So in this case, this one allele P is at an equilibrium frequency of a little bit more than 6. The allele frequency of the other allele would be a little bit less than 4 to add up to 1. And we've got mean fitness for the population plotted on the y-axis. So the equilibrium point between these two alleles is going to depend on the strength of selection against each of the two homozygotes. So you'll remember um, in the case of the sickle cell trait, the S homozygote was very, very strongly selected against. So that S allele is going to be maintained at relatively low frequency compared to the A allele because the A homozygotes had very little reduced fitness relative to the heterozygote. And so this equilibrium frequency is going to be maintained as what we call a stable equilibrium. Stable equilibrium means that it's going to be self-correcting. So if you will remember the natural selection always, always, always increases the average fitness in a population. So if anything happens to move these allele frequencies away from the stable equilibrium, say one of these other factors in uh, the Hardy-Weinberg conditions, uh, genetic drift causes it to wander away, uh, migration ca causes these allele frequency to change, natural selection is going to bring it back toward this e stable equilibrium frequency. So in addition to this phenomenon called overdominance, there's another one called underdominance, and this is pretty much just the opposite. This is homozygote advantage, a case where both homozygotes have greater fitness than the heterozygote. And we can look at this again in terms of this graph of allele frequencies compared to the mean fitness of the population. And we can see that when we've got this kind of balance of the two alleles in the population. That is the lowest fitness that the population can have. So if it's at these frequencies, whichever way it tends to move, if something nudges it 
toward higher frequency of P or lower frequency of P, it's going to be pulled by natural selection up toward the greater fitness at one of these two equilibrium points. The population has greater fitness if it happens to move this way, but there's no guarantee because if something moves it in this way, it's not going to go to lower fitness by natural selection. It's only going to go to higher fitness. So the equilibrium is unstable as compared to the stable equilibrium that we saw in overdominance, one of the other of the alleles will be fixed in the population depending on the starting frequencies or genetic drift, whichever way this um, the allele frequencies get pulled, it's going to be pulled all the way the rest of the way to fixation. So again, this is going to tend to decrease the genetic diversity in the population by eliminating one of those two alleles. Returning to our list of factors that maintain stable genetic variation. Um, this is a phenomenon that you saw in your book called negative frequency dependent selection. So this is selection in favor of the less abundant allele. So this is a case where the fitness of a phenotype depends on its abundance in the population. So this is selection for the rare allele. The example that was given in your book was the case of the elderflower orchids in Europe that come in purple and yellow morphs and so these Flowers are pollinated by bees, but they actually don't produce the nectar that the bees are looking for. So they sort of cheat the bees out of their nectar. But the downside is that the bees learn to recognize the flowers that didn't give them any nectar and avoid them. So whichever flower color is the least abundant in the population ends up having the greatest fitness. So these graphs over here on the right show the reproductive success, male and female, of the yellow morph as a function of the frequency of the yellow morph on the x-axis. And so you'll see that the greatest fitness is when the yellow morph is at the very lowest frequency. It becomes less and less fit as it becomes more common. And what we end up finding is that, again, we reach this equilibrium frequency between the yellow and purple morph at around 70% yellow and 30% purple. But my favorite example of this phenomenon is a different case, the frequency dependent selection in bluegill sunfish. So bluegill sunfish come in obviously two sexes, male and female, but the males come in two different types. There's a parental male that maintains a territory, builds a nest, and then tries to attract females to come and lay eggs in his nest, then the female goes on her way and the parental male stays behind and protects the eggs and takes care of them until they hatch. The other form of male is called a cuckolder or a sneaker male. So the sneaker males um, sort of hang around the nests of the parental male and when the females come to lay their eggs they sneak in, spew a bunch of sperm over the nest, hoping to get a few fertilizations of the female's egg along with the parental male. So these are two different male strategies. And it turns out that the one that's more successful depends on which is more common in the population. So when there are lots of parental males, the sneaker or satellite strategy is beneficial because they can get reproduction without all of that parental investment, taking all the trouble of building a nest, um, attracting the females, protecting the eggs. They can just swoop in, spew some sperm, and be on their way. But someone's got to court the females and take care of the offspring. So if there are too few parental males, the sneaker or satellite strategy is not a benefit, and the parental males have greater fitness. So. Frequency dependent selection again occurs when the fitness of a phenotype depends on how common that phenotype is in the environment. And that um, this maintains genetic diversity, and it's called negative frequency dependent selection, in which the rarer allele is favored. So the last mechanism I want to talk to you about that can maintain allelic diversity in a population is called mutation selection balance. And this explains some cases of deleterious recessive genes being maintained in the population even though there's, there's relatively strong selection against them. And so the idea here is that different loci have different mutation rates. And so if the mutation rate is high enough that as selection is removing alleles from the population, mutation is regenerating them at 
sort of an equal rate so that there's this balance between mutation and selection. So the frequency of the deleterious allele depends on this balance between selection removing the allele and mutation generating the allele. So if there's strong selection plus a relatively low mutation rate, that deleterious recessive allele is going to be maintained at a low frequency. If there's weak selection, so that's just a little bit uh, detrimental to have this recessive condition and a high mutation rate, it's going to be maintained at a higher frequency. And so we'll work on some problems in class um, to demonstrate how this works. So just to review our list of factors that maintain stable genetic variation, selection for dominant alleles, overdominance or heterozygote advantage, frequency dependent selection, and mutation selection balance. And the two factors that we've seen so far that decrease genetic variation are selective sweep and underdominance. So again, we're going to be adding to both of these lists uh, with other mechanisms as we move away from selection and into the other factors that can change allele frequencies in a population.